You know, life has a lot of different ways to teach us about what matters the most. And I want to tell you about one of my favorite ways. I am standing on the world's largest monopoly board. It's located in downtown San Jose, just a few miles away from where I live. And it's not just a decoration. This actually is a playable monopoly board. I haven't played much monopoly in recent years, but I used to play a lot when I was growing up. And if we'll let it, monopoly has something profound to teach us about life's most important lesson. I learned it from my grandmother because my grandmother taught me how to play the game. Let me tell you about my grandmother. My grandmother lived with us when I was growing up as a kid and she was a wonderful person. She used to tell great ghost stories. She was a great cook. She would make banana bread and this dessert called red velvet cake, it's mostly butter. She would pop popcorn on Friday nights in bacon grease and then put the bacon bits in the popcorn. It was fabulous. Nobody in my grandmother's family lived to be too old, but we loved my grandmother. She was a wonderful person, but she was the most ruthless Monopoly player I have ever known. Imagine what would have happened if um, Vince Lombardi had married Lady Macbeth, maybe, and they had a kid. And you get some sense of the way that my grandmother played Monopoly. When the game would start, I would get my $1,500 and I'd want to hold on to it. But my grandmother understood that acquisition is necessary to win, that money is how you keep score. And so eventually, inevitably, my grandmother would become master of the board, buy every piece of property she landed on, mortgage that, and acquire everything else. And I would always land on her property once too often, and I would have to give her my last dollar and quit in utter defeat. And then she would say to me, don't worry about it, Johnny, one day you'll learn how to play the game. And I always hated it when she would say that. And then one summer, I was about 10 years old, and I played with a neighborhood kid, and I learned that summer how to play the game. It gradually dawned on me, money's how you keep score. You gotta acquire everything you can. And by the time that fall rolled around, and I was gonna play my grandmother again, I was more ruthless than she was. I was ready to bend the rules if I had to, to beat my grandmother. I played her with sweaty palms. Relentlessly, inexorably, I drove her off the board. Slowly, with great cunning and skill, I exposed the soft underbelly of my grandmother's vulnerability. I can still remember it happened at Marvin Gardens. And I looked at my grandmother. She was an old lady by now. She was a widow by the time I knew her well. She had raised six children. She raised my mom. She loved my mom. She loved me. And I took everything she had. I destroyed her financially and psychologically. I beat my grandmother and watched her give me her last dollar and quit in utter defeat. And then I had one more lesson to learn because the great lesson always comes at the end of the game. And I first heard this from James Dobson, who talked about a time when he learned to play Monopoly with his family. The great lesson at the end of the game is this. When the game is over, it all goes back in the box. All that money, all that property, all those houses, all those hotels, boardwalk and park place, Everything, when the game is over, goes back in the box. I didn't want everything to go back in the box. I wanted to leave everything out as a kind of perpetual memorial to my great skill. This is the great lesson of life. When the game is over, all the stuff goes back in the box. And so you have to ask yourself, how should I play the game? In light of this one great truth, the psalmist says in Psalm 90, teach us to number our days aright so that we can gain a heart of wisdom. It's a funny thing. Almost everybody I know has really good intentions in life. People want to know God well. They want to do good work. They want to develop good character. They want to have great relationships. They want to be really good parents. 
And yet we find ourselves drifting into another mode. When Nancy and I had two children and they were real small, we were on a plane one time doing a long cross-country flight. We'd taken over the back row of the plane. Nobody else wanted to be near us because it didn't look good, it didn't smell good, it was littered with dirty diapers and crayons and crackers and crumbs. You know you're in trouble when the flight attendant says, would you mind if your kids played outside? And we were wondering, why did we bring these kids with us on this trip? Why did we have these kids in the first place? And then a guy a couple rows in front of us turned around and surveyed the damage. And he looked at me and he said, are those your two kids? And I thought about it. And I said, yes, they are. And he said, my wife and I would give anything in the world to have two kids. I said, you don't have any kids? He said, no, we have five kids. We'd give anything in the world to have two kids. It's part of the human condition. We have all these dreams for the kind of people we want to be, the kind of lives we want to live, the kind of work we want to do, the kind of families we'd like to raise. And yet we find our lives getting away from us. We do not number our days aright. We forget the one great lesson. And so God calls us back to it over and over again. In Jerusalem, uh, Jewish people from all over the world would come over the years and build synagogues. And there's one synagogue there that has a coffin that's built into the wall. And when people ask why it is there, they are told that in the Talmud we are taught that each human being is to repent one day before they die, the day before the last day of their life. And everybody will ask, well, how do I know what's going to be the day before I die? And then they're told, we are to live every day as if it is the day before our last day. We are to live every day in light of the great truth that it's all going back in the box. And so I must arrange my life around what matters most. And I know so many wonderful people who have such good dreams, but they just drift into living their lives around things that are only temporal, things that cannot bring satisfaction, things that do not really matter to God. My grandmother, in many ways, lived a pretty simple life. She raised six children, uh, three boys first, Hack, Jack, and Mac, believe it or not, and then three girls, including my mom. She never traveled a great deal. She never wrote a book. She never had a job outside the home I know of, except working at a little bakery in Rockford, Illinois. But none of that mattered much to her because she understood what was temporal and what's eternal. She understood what matters a lot and what's not so important. She remembered this one great lesson that when the game is over, everything is going back in the box. And that's the lesson that some of the smartest people in the world forget. There was a man named Jesus who told one of his most unforgettable stories about just such a smart guy. But that one, I want to tell you about someplace else. Jesus told a story, I'll give it to you in modern terms, of a busy guy. He was committed to success, whatever success took, and it took everything. He'd work 12 or 14 hours a day, joined boards of directors to be able to meet people who could help him climb the ladder. His wife would nag him sometimes about his family. He knew the kids were growing up and he was kind of missing it. From time to time they would complain about games they weren't playing or lunches they weren't eating together, but after a while they stopped complaining because they stopped expecting it would ever be any different. He'd bring his briefcase home from work every night and his troubled his son. His son finally asked him, Dad, how come every day you come home you always bring your briefcase? And his dad said, well, son, it's because I can't get all my work done at the office. And his son said, Dad, couldn't they put you in a slower group? But he was not big on the slower group deal. One night he went to bed about one o'clock in the morning. He woke up and he felt a twinge in his chest. And his wife made an appointment for him to see the doctors. They told him that he had all the classic symptoms, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, and he would need to make some significant changes in his lifestyle. For a little while he did, but after his symptoms went away, his motivation to change went away also. He would often say to himself, this man, there'll be plenty of time to be with my kids. There'll be plenty of time to enjoy my family. There'll be plenty of time to take care of my body. 
in six months or so when things settle down. And although he was a very bright guy, this man in Jesus' story, he never seemed to notice that things never actually settled down. He knew his life was kind of out of balance. There was a church down the street from them and his wife had talked to him sometimes about being involved there. But Sunday morning seemed like it was the only time he could crash. Besides, he said, there'll be plenty of time for God in six months or so when things settle down. And then one day, a remarkable thing happened in the life of this man in Jesus' story. The COO of his company came to him and said, you know, you're not going to believe this, but we're on the brink of an economic miracle. We got orders coming in so fast, our supply can't even keep up with demand. And if we catch this wave, we'll be set for life. This is it. This is the dream. But we got headaches too. We got inventory problems and our software is outdated. And if we don't make some changes around here, we could be in trouble. Now, from that moment on, this man in Jesus' story is like a man possessed. And every waking moment is devoted to this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And then it hits him. He could reorganize everything. He could tear down all of the old structures of his company and put up newer, bigger structures. He could put his company through a technological revolution and they could go wireless and paperless. And he went home that night and he said to his wife, you know what this means, don't you? When I have finished this project, I will have climbed the ladder to the top rung. I will have achieved the dream, financial security. You can finally relax. She'd heard that kind of talk before, so she didn't get too excited. She went up to bed at 11 o'clock. She asked him, you want to come on up with me? And he said, no, I'll be there in a couple of minutes. I want to get a little more work done on my computer. You go ahead. About 3 o'clock in the morning, she woke up, and his side of the bed was still empty. So she went downstairs to bring him up. His head was resting on his arm in front of his computer terminal and she went to touch him on the shoulder to bring him to bed, but his skin was cold when she touched it, and he did not respond to her voice. She got a panicky feeling in the pit of her stomach. She called 911, but by the time the paramedics got there, they told her that he had had a massive heart attack and had been dead for hours. His death was a major story in the financial community, and because of his prominence, he was written up in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes, and it's too bad he was dead because he would have loved to have read what they wrote about him. And then they had a memorial service. And again, because of his prominence, the whole community turned out. They all filed past his casket and they all said the same stupid thing that people always say at funerals when they view the body. He looks so peaceful. A rigor mortis will kind of do that to you. And then people got up to eulogize him at the service that they had. One of them said, he was a visionary. He was an entrepreneur. He was a leader. Somebody else noted all of his technological innovations. They said he was a, a developer of new delivery systems. He was creative. And then somebody else got up and said, you know, nobody ever caught him cheating on his expense account or his taxes or his wife. He was a straight arrow guy. Somebody else got up and said, he was kind of a pillar in the community. He knew everybody. He was a networker. And because of his prominence, they erected a memorial to this guy, this busy, admired, wealthy, successful, family-neglecting, God-ignoring life. And they wrote on that marker all of these fabulous words, leader, visionary, innovator, networker. And at the top of the marker, they wrote the big word, the word that this man and many other people in our world will sell their soul for. Success. And when it was night and everybody had gone home, Unseen, unheard, the angel of God came to the cemetery and made its way to this memorial and traced with a single finger the one word that God chose to summarize this man's life. Fool. You fool, God says to this man. This night your soul will be required of you. 
It's fascinating detail in Jesus' story. When he uses that language will be required, it was taken from the financial arena in his day. And Jesus is saying, nothing you got, not the beat of your heart, not your own soul, really belongs to you. It belongs to God and one day will come due. Now, who's going to get all of those things you stored up for yourself? He was a really bright guy, the man in Jesus' story. He learned to play the game, played it really well. He just forgot this one detail, that sooner or later the game would end. The game always ends. And that when the game is over, all the stuff goes back in the box. And then Jesus closes his story with one unforgettable sentence. So it is, he says, for every human being who stores up things for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Now, the sobering news is, I don't know, and you don't either, that you can ever become rich in the stuff of this world. Doesn't really matter, because when the game's over, it's all going to end up in the same place. But the good news is, it is possible for you, for me, for anybody, to be rich toward God, to be rich in the eyes of God. And this is not a complex deal. Jesus spells this out quite clearly as well. He says it's all about two things, loving God, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then loving people, loving your neighbor as you love yourself. To love God means that I come to enjoy Him, to worship Him, to serve Him, to delight in Him, to be with Him. Because when you love somebody, the primary way that gets expressed is in the desire to be with one another. And I can do that with God in quite simple ways. When I wake up in the morning, I can just whisper a prayer, God, would you be with me? Would you walk with me through this day, whatever happens? When I sit down to have breakfast in the morning, I can remember that just as the food is nourishing my body, so the presence of God with me can nourish my soul, my spirit, all through the day. When I drive my car, I can do that remembering that Jesus is right there with me, maybe a little scared in the car. When I go to work, when I am with friends, all through the day, I can remember, I can invite. Every moment is an opportunity to be with Jesus and to learn from Jesus how to be like Jesus. And then fundamental to loving God is loving the people who mean so much to Him that He puts in my life. And each moment is just a sacred opportunity to do that. I'm very aware of that right now because on the day that we're filming this, tomorrow, my wife and I will take our youngest child, our son, to college. And it seems to me like the years have gone so fast. Nance was at the grocery store uh, the week after our second daughter went off to college, and it kind of hit her by surprise. Um, Nance was getting potatoes for a meal we'd have later on that week, and what struck her was she only got three potatoes. She thought we used to be a five potato family. And then one of our potatoes went away, and then another one went away to college, and now we're down to three potatoes. And she got so choked up, she started to cry in the vegetable department of the supermarket. So then she went, got a packet of Hostess Ho-Ho's, ate them, and felt much better after that. But the reality is, we get those potatoes, we get those people in our lives for such a brief window. The psalmist said, teach us to number our days aright so that we gain a heart of wisdom. And if we do, if you love God, if you love the people that He puts in your life, you and I can be rich toward God, which is the only kind of richness that counts. Because all the other kinds, they're going to end up here. They're going back in the box. You know, Haddon Robinson, who I heard one time visualize this story of the death of the rich fool in such a powerful way, said that it's the account of a man who was really smart when it comes to what doesn't matter a whole lot, but really foolish when it comes to what matters most of all. 
And of course, the problem is, that's not just his story. That's my story. That's all of our stories. So there's another way to remember what really matters. And I saw this idea first in a book by Bill Hybels. It's a real simple thought. Take a pad of sticky notes and write the word temporary on a bunch of them. And then put those notes all over the place. Put them on your iPod, put them on your TV, put it on the DVD, put it on your appliances, put it on your car, put it on the clothes in your closet. Just remind yourself, all of this stuff, temporary, 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 temporary. None of it's gonna last. Now that's a word that we never hear on advertisements. You never see in magazines where they talk about this great car. It's just temporary. So that'll help remind us all of what doesn't last. And then take another sticky pad and write down the word eternal right there. Take this one off and put it on people because people are what will last forever. Put this one on the members of your family. Put it on your friends. Stick it on your boss if you'd like to. Put it on the kid behind the counter at 7-Eleven. Don't forget that it goes on the forehead of the person you dislike the most. And don't forget to put one on your own forehead as well. Because you and everybody you know are eternal beings. And the day is coming when all of the temporary stuff is going to fade away and our 401ks and our resumes and corner offices and houses and all of our stuff will fade into irrelevance and forgottenness. Only one thing will last. There was a movie years ago that you might have seen. It's called Ghost. And at the very end of the life of this character played by Patrick Swayze, he says this one thing. He says, you can take the love with you. You can take the love with you. Well, that's really a, a version of what it is that Jesus said. The goal of life is to be rich toward God. And you do that by loving God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love Him with everything you got. And then love the people around you because the people last, because God is eternal. Because you can take the love with you. The object of the game is to be rich toward God.